Alrighty. Welcome, everyone, to uh, the Ella Talks Netherlands, one of the third one that we're having so far. So we're very excited to welcome Sanne Pols uh, as a special guest today. I'll let you know already that um, this talk is going to be recorded and available on the Ella platform um, after, after the fact. Um, but we're only going to be recording people that are speaking. So your mics will be automatically muted during the talk. Um, and we have auto-generated closed caps captions available for you. Um, so you can turn them on or off using the CC button on the bottom of your screen. Uh, so yeah, we're going to welcome Sonne Pols. Uh, she is the owner and leader of um, LGB Tours uh, based in Amsterdam. Uh, Sanna is a personal uh, storyteller as well. So she not only gives you a wonderful walking tour through Amsterdam, but highlights that and compliments them with her um, amazing storytelling skills. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, Sanna, welcome. Thanks so much for, for joining us today. Um, yeah, I'm so excited to, for the listeners to get to know you and to hear more about you and your, your work. What some of our listeners don't know is that we already uh, spoke together at one point last year um, and our conversation left me with such a wonderful impression that I just really wanted um, to share you and what you do. Um, yeah, so before we get started and delve into an array of things relating to your, your work and uh, how you are involved in the queer community in the Netherlands, Um, I just want to acknowledge that we're in a difficult season of, of life with COVID and everything. So I want to start by asking you, how are you doing? Um, how are you navigating these strange times? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, thanks for, for having me. It's really such a pleasure. Um, really nice, uh, especially on this platform of Ella. Totally support it and it grows even bigger than it already is. Um, so thanks for that. And also thank you for yeah, um, asking about how, how it is these times, especially as a, as a queer entrepreneur and very much in the social area. Um, to be honest, it was really hard. And uh, last year, I think I'm now for six years, I'm a Uh, working for myself as an entrepreneur, having my own business. And, uh, the fifth year is always this this line, like, uh, are you going to make it or not? And actually last year was a year that was already in January and February, very much the summer, booked with more things. And my tour was really uh, running and I also saw it in winter, but it was a promising summer and also with a lot of schools and big groups to lead and uh, Trainings in companies for uh, inclusive workspace, and uh, of course that all got cancelled. Uh, as this society is money money based, it was yeah. very difficult for me because I didn't get any support of government to do different kind of projects, and then you cannot actually do anything. Um, so I'm smiling because I'm happy I'm still here, yeah, here in this house. But I was really, really dreading it, really, really dreading it. And it didn't have any um, financial backup or support plan possible also before that. So that was it was hard. And that was not even the biggest thing. I really saw how not meeting all these queers from around the world uh, made me less happy. Because I always say, like, after every LGB tour, I get this natural high. Mm -hmm. It's very true. It's very true. Like I feel very lucky to be able to travel around the world and meet all these queer people, but then in my own city. And so without that, then, yeah. Yeah. Know. Yeah. That's beautifully said to travel around the world, but in your own city, because you obviously attract an array of people that come and, and do your tours. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you arrived at that point in your life five, six years ago, starting LGB tours? Yes. Definitely. And, and also it all has to do with this neon shirt of Pride. Oh, nice. The University of Amsterdam and the Pride platform has also a role in that. Okay. So I think I'm now 38 and I moved here um, 
11 years ago already, when I was 27, I just finished my studies journalism uh, in the south of the Netherlands, where I'm also from. And I just finished my uh, I just finished my relationship with my boyfriend. Uh, we were together for four years. And also, I thought about it a lot, but I was quite sure I was straight. <laughs> um, but it also says a lot already, the sentence. And then I, I wanted to do a master's after journalism. And I wanted, I'm quite a practical person, really like action and doing things. Um, um, I won't say I'm someone who can read for hours in a book. So I thought if I'm going to do a master, it has to be something that I'm like super, super, super interested in. And it was always like religion and culture and how it works in the world to understand people. So um, I started the master's religion studies actually the other university in Amsterdam, the Vrije Universiteit. And I already immediately subscribed for the uh, student group there uh, to meet people. And when I arrived there the first day, there was this really but I'm proud lesbian. And she looked at me from head to toe and said, well, I hope you can handle it over here. And I thought, what? Well, I thought, I I really didn't like what she said and um, uh, she was also like part of the student commission like the travel commission mm -hmm. was part of she was a lot of time in my head and I thought well I really really she's annoying to me and I don't like her it was at this one point I was I think in front of my mirror at home preparing or putting on makeup for a student meeting with her as if my reflection said like hey Sana what are you doing what's going on yeah, and I couldn't ignore anymore that I was in love with her. So luckily, she was also in love with me. We got into a relationship, which was quite weird for me because my identity wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Actually, the best part was that I was in love, and all these cliches of movies suddenly came to life, and it was much better than before with a the guy. There was one thing which was like unbelievable to me, and really like a shock. Like before, when I would walk with my boyfriend on the street and we would walk hand in hand, there was no one who would turn their head, no one who would give a thumbs up, uh, let alone no one who would say curse words or something. And mm. now suddenly I was walking still with someone I was in love with, hand in hand on the street. This time it was a girl. And people would say something about it. They would say if they agree with my love or not. Mm -hmm. For me, it was the group everyone I thought I belonged to suddenly decided for me if it was okay or not okay. I think because it was this hard cut for me, I didn't have an in-closet experience, that I saw so vividly how at least strange this was. I didn't want to um, get used to it. I was sure I didn't want that. And I wanted to do something with it, something active. So immediately I... Um, well, that was also a time that I transferred and did also religion studies at the um, University of Amsterdam. Yeah. And I immediately um, went to the this group. I was part of the board of Eva Pride, and they did really good projects. We were the first um, boat, for example, with the, the Canal Parade, the first university boat uh, oh, wow. nationwide. Yeah, it was really, really cool. Also, a lot of activism they did. It was a person who wanted uh, their own gender on the on the, the diploma certificate uh, it was a big problem then for the university and we did a lot of action and then finally uh, they changed it mm. and it was also the time that I started with this personal storytelling I started with groups on like it was a project from a big company for groups on primary school uh, sharing stories like this story I just shared now. Uh, to children 10, 11, and was together actually with, with different backgrounds. Um, some, sometimes it sounds a bit like a joke. We were with three uh, people, students, in front of a uh, class of primary kids. One was homosexual, one was Jewish, and one uh, uh, was a Muslim. And actually, that connection of the three, that really, really had a big and deeper effect on the kids because it was not like reaching for... How do you say that in Dutch? You say, for like you have to take one idea, but 
the idea of making space for differences mm -hmm. really worked on these kids. And well, now I grew it at work and um, I started in 2015 uh, for myself. I, I, at that company where I talked about, I got a prize for that project actually uh, from um, the Ministry for um, LGBT Innovation Award. I wow. That was a good step to start for myself. Yeah, congratulations. Um, thank you. And I started, didn't st start with this tour, just projects like the Project Photo Award and be a, being a project manager, but I to tell the story more. So I started more storytelling in theaters and doing BNI trainings in big companies, which is mm -hmm. really way harder for grown ups than for kids because kids have a much more flexible brain yeah. uh, and they don't tell what, what's expected or mm -hmm. socially okay to tell. Yeah. Um, then I thought, I want, I'm, I'm missing something. It's just like one way I'm telling something and people like it or not, or the company gets a training or not and the people leave. I wanted to do the interaction. I wanted to make like one-on-one -on -one history, like sharing stories and paying it forward, doing something extra. So I thought, why not walk my favorite pink route in the city of Amsterdam and meet all these queers and allies from around the world and share personal stories and talk about more the hidden queer history of the city. Oh um, yeah, that's what I started three years ago. And just talking about it always <laughs> makes me smile. Although yeah. it's now very silent, of course, because tourism is will be a late start after COVID. Um, this is also the story that I tell at the beginning of my tour. So I really yeah. want to do also like an effect stories and stories and stories and telling about other people on tour who told a story about their own experience and making stories from minority groups much more true and recognized as historical facts and history because it's already so hard to find like history uh, in, in minority groups because it's mostly hidden. Uh, also make it, yeah. making it like action, not only like looking at the past and okay, that's something behind us now. Being aware that we are making history at this point, any moment, like how we are having this talk uh, it's our yeah, responsibility that we are making history, actually. Yeah. So in that way, on your on your walks as well, when you're giving your stories, you're not only acknowledging the history of the places that you're walking by, but you're you're acknowledging that by being present there together and sharing each other's stories, you're you're recreating a different kind of history every time you walk through uh, this this pink route, as you called it. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. That's incredible. And this pink route, is it something that you um, that you uh, mapped out or is it an existing route that you have just complemented with your storytelling? That's a good question. I think what I did um, was that I knew I actually took um, subjects I wanted to talk about. So I have a few subjects I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about pride. Was pride in your country? you have a pride? Is that possible? How does it look like? For who is it? Do you like how it is right now? How did it start? What's your image of Amsterdam? And how do you think pride is here? And how did it start? Did it start from protest or not? Do you think it's good that companies join the kennel parade? Yeah. That's one of a hot topic they always talk about. So I thought, okay, that's near the water. That will be on the canal. <clears throat> then I wanted to talk about religion and homosexuality. It's a lot of times the media put against each other. That's not the only, only vision there is. I wanted to also shine different lights on subjects and different perspectives. For example, in 1986, there was a church in Amsterdam, which still exists, to give their blessing to the first gay and lesbian couples in, in, the, in Amsterdam. It's 15 wow. years before uh, us opening up marriage by law. Mm -hmm. And I find that very important to tell and share as well that there is space in, in religious communities for queer communities and communities work with communities. Yeah, that's such a beautiful message indeed to emphasize in, in, in your tours because often we, we are taught to perceive religion and queerness as things that cannot coexist. Um, so it's beautiful that you uh, shed light on that. I didn't even know that. So I'm looking forward to also when I go on one of your tours to, to learn more about that. Um, so you were talking about 
asking people about their different experiences with pride and what does that look like where they come from um so on your tours you kind of bring this queer history to life H how do you see how have you perceived pride um in the netherlands has it progressed in your opinion and when you look at these historical places how do you see do you see a progression from yeah from for instance this church to how we operate today yeah Mm. So my tour is also all the time something I learn equally with the guests on my tour. And I'm open for whatever comes by or changing my thoughts on subjects also all the time. I'm not an historian, historian? Historian, yes. Yeah. Historian. I'm not an, um, I didn't do gender studies, didn't study gender studies. I'm also still quite new, like coming out of the transparent closet for me. <laughs> uh, so I, my view is my view, it's my perspective, and it's totally colored by all these different things. Mm. So I think uh, the Burgemeester, how do you say Burgemeester? Is that the English? Prime Minister? The <laughs> so the head of the city yes uh when the head of the city we now have a woman for the first time as a yeah. head of the city I'm just yeah that i like that i'm having a blank the, oh so mayor saying, of the course mayor. there we go thank you i always speak of words also on the tour actually <laughs> the head of the city okay mayor of amsterdam, the former mayor of amsterdam who passed away um, there was one point that he changed the name Gay Pride, it was always Gay Pride here, into Pride, mm. um, with the idea of more inclusivity. And I think that's great. But I saw something else happening. You cannot, uh, um, it's not happening only by changing language. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to happen in all the different layers. You have to act on it. And then there were suddenly flags in all the city, like um, with the text, I can be myself. That was not community-based, it was very individual. And actually that was the first year changing that name for the idea of more inclusivity it was the first year a lot of straight people around me started talking about I to be myself, I want a straight flag. Mm. So it um, change comes with all these things, right? And I don't th know if there's a right way, but there's a right way to all the time being conscious, knowing that there is not a finish point. And I think uh, the, the things that are difficult for Amsterdam is that we're still living a bit on 2001, we're the first country in the world with opening the marriage for everyone. It's really long time ago. A lot of even cities in the Netherlands already passed us with being more inclusive in the queer community because mm -hmm. that's very important. Um, having much more creative queer spaces uh, what I saw since I live here is that that became even less so there are less queer alternative spaces uh, like maybe as you see in Instagram or as you experience people now outside live their queer experience uh, mm -hmm. places and make their queer places and that's actually for me that's a sign of protest it means the city doesn't uh, have these places anymore for queers mm -hmm. uh, and it's um, actually the last year there's more coming again uh, but there was a time it was really really flat and with the idea of uh, I think the city of Amsterdam is really good with saying uh, everyone is included but this is the space you have to fit in here mm -hmm. you have to adjust and if you don't adjust then you, you shut up because we, we make space for everyone this is the space yeah um, so I think it's it's difficult to say like how it evolved here. Uh, I would love to see more more alternativity, more space for differences, literally mm -hmm. more space for differences. Not only 187 um, different groups of people from different countries, uh, but really that they are <laughs> okay. Okay, one time then. Oh, uh, wants to say something classic <laughs> we get yeah uh, VIP really, appearance. yeah difference for everyone like 
true difference that you can say in your job on Monday, hey, I went to club church two times on Sunday. And the other person can say, hey, I went to the church on Sunday two times for praying. And I think um, I would love to see that. Yeah. yeah, that nobody, you know, blinks twice when you say I went to club church or versus the church. Um, yeah. Yeah. I also I really like the way that you uh, phrased this about the fact that queer people are now congregating like on the streets and recreating like social places for themselves as like a sign of protest, you know, because I, I think that's such a <laughs> VIP cat is back. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's so truthful, uh, you know, with um, especially during COVID, you know, that's, of course, another factor. But with so many places closing down, you're seeing a lot more, you know, kind of I don't know if grassroots is the right word, but, you know, queer people organizing themselves to create a space for themselves. Um, yeah. So so you said you saw a lot of places disappearing. Um, I'm also positive about that, actually, because it, yeah, this is normal, right? It's just uh, it's totally OK. Yeah. I, I also think it's positive because I was at the beginning of my tour also a lot of times like um, a bit like uh, irritable, like um, no one is here taking action or protesting or an action in movement is a good thing. I think that's really a good thing because movement is movement and then things can change. Uh, so it's a, it's a sign that, that people want things different and they're owning their or claiming even their space. Um, love that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so now with the tours, they're opening up again for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, so, yeah uh, for there... the people who have money to travel and the possibility. So yeah. I see a, a huge difference in people who are booking my tour, actually. And I'm well, working on that, how to... Do you, get a, do you get some, like, local... Do you get a lot of locals on your tours, actually? It depends very much how you can find it or promote it. It's, like, two totally different streams or something mm -hmm. like i'm now tra trying to work a bit on my new website then i'm thinking yeah english or dutch uh, that's actually not comparable even because the dutchies the tour is also different when i have it with dutchies um, if, if i'm gonna stereotype they like it less when i'm critical for example on the city of amsterdam when i'm critical about a canal parade or when i'm <laughs> critical it's critical actually <laughs> And um, people abroad, there are so much more nuances and so much more things to talk about. Also, it's much more normal to talk about religion. It's much more normal and to talk about uh, com community, family community. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's all things that are different in, in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, it would be more easier with groups to talk about um, cruising clubs or things like uh, club church. Um, Oh, and yes, I have groups. I have team outings or uh, other types of groups. Um, it's, Amazing. it's very different. Very different. And I'm also really lucky. I'm actually more, I feel more blessed even uh, by doing the tours now living in the Netherlands because, because it's really, of course, as a as you hear, I'm very critical, but it's really, really, really a very good place to be queer. Yeah, so. definitely. For sure. I um, Because you say you are so critical, I have this, this one question that I always like to ask, especially during Pride, where I think it's a time to celebrate, but also to be reflective. Um, how do you feel about tolerance in the Netherlands and how do you feel about acceptance in the Netherlands and yeah do they are they related for you currently um yeah do you want to elaborate definitely tolerance is the thing that made me so I didn't even have a word for it so shocked and like why do you think you have something to say if you tolerate me or not it's it's on, on forehand if that's English that, that the other person exists or is there or tolerate the person on forehand because it's another person. 
And for me, it was a great chakra that suddenly I was part of a minority group. I had this minority experience and the people that were first standing next to me or saw me, saw me as the same or identified, suddenly choose if they tolerated me or not. I'm not even, I don't even want to say that I, if that happens, I don't even want to, I want to say I don't speak that language and not want to go along in any kind. So that they pro tolerance me or not, I just, no, it's like a big no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in short, <laughs> a big no. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of the times, um, The Netherlands is described as as so accepting and, and gay friendly. So I always wonder, you know, there's this perception, but how do how do we really experience that here? Despite, of course, you know, acknowledging the privilege that we do have um, here in the Netherlands. Yeah. Because you yeah. said also that you suddenly you experienced that, that very conscious shift of people uh, with your with your partner holding their hand down the street, and you had this very conscious moment of realizing how the gaze shifted on you and how suddenly um you know other people felt like they had you know the right to have agency over you know how you are perceived or your status yeah i i also i i think that well, first of all i wrote down that i now remember that i made this top 10 and i came out of this i was 27 and i still had to feeling that I had to come out of the closet. I was super scared. I didn't have a reason to be scared. I found that very interesting already. And then there was actually this top 10 I wrote down of how of the possibilities, how people react on you mm. and they tolerate or not. But it's all like all about them. It's not like being there for another person. So I had reactions as, um, um, well, not in my backyard, but it is okay. How do you make space for a difference? You do not because you say, I own all the public space or whatever. It's okay, whatever you do, but you cannot take any space. So where, where should we live? On the moon? Like literally. Yeah. Another thing was, oh yeah, poor, poor you. Poor you. That's on the person who's saying it because we wouldn't be poor us if there was just space to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the reaction was also very intrusive on how do it in the bedroom sexually now i feel very comfortable to <clears throat> ask it back or not answering it but actually in, in the beginning i answered all these questions because i wanted to be accepted and looking back and i was 27 so a lot older actually and then, that, then i'm thinking about these young kids coming out of the closet mm -hmm. actually when i think about the beginning that i answered all these questions i feel uh, it doesn't feel good it feels really Uh, over my grenzen is going too far these questions and so much want to be accepted that that I just answered it while also a bit laughing with them um, yeah so that's quite sad actually I think um, yeah yeah it's, <laughs> I like that the 10 things of uh, that people say yeah it's um it's crossing a boundary you know it's one of those things that we're taught to you know make other people comfortable rather than create space for our own comfort Yeah. Um, and that's universal, even in the Netherlands, um, although uh, we have it we have it very well here as well. Um, and now, you know, indeed, it's good to be reflective of the things where, where growth can still happen. But uh, it is still Pride Month or the 24th of June. So in that spirit, um, I'm curious, is there anything about you that you are sometimes it's hard to, to find things that we're proud of about ourselves, right? But is there anything about you where, where you're very proud about a an, an aspect of your, maybe your identity, an aspect of your life or something that you pour your, pour your energy in? There's just so much shame on personal pride. Right? Yeah, exactly. That's it's, like, like it's a difficult question for some people. Super I, good. It's super good. It's super good. It's interesting that I also feel it. I think um, I think I'm I'm proud, or I actually feel like I'm happy that I have have this thing that I'm that I cannot do different than being super open and honest and people call that 
uh, brave. But for me, it's really, really the only way. Um, I can tell stories that feel very uncomfortable for me, but I, I tell them because I see like what we can all gain from it is so incredibly big uh, because we, if I'm uncomfortable, then I'm sure other people also have these stories being uncomfortable, but sharing it, sharing these true stories really can have a huge impact because when I tell about that I uh, did it, I thought I was straight, but I always fantasized about having sex with girls when I had a boyfriend, but I thought that was normal. I thought that all the friends, girlfriends around me didn't, yeah. <laughs> didn't dare to share that. And when I say that on my tour, then suddenly all these uh, stories come up and all these relieved uh, faces and I think it's very important to that, that queerness comes in making space for the things for our experiences and that they become normal and mm -hmm. not weird because it's the other person who says at one point something is weird in your own perspective and experience nothing is weird and always starts with normal it has to be someone else at one point who says you shouldn't play with cars I shouldn't play with this. Well, for you, you were just being yourself and normal. And I think that normality, and you can call it queer normality, but it's like people say that it's weird. Well, it's still normal. If we start sharing that more and more, and I love to be like a like a leader in that to sh <laughs> share all these things that might feel uncomfortable and weird, but I know it's very normal. And it's even from an activistic point that I think... Um, of course, it's normal because it's my story. So, or it counts as much. And I think I'm proud of that. That these these stories that I tell, these personal stories, make space for other people, and that joys me a lot. It's, it joys me a lot, and I even get emotional from that because I find it so super super important to make space for differences. Mm -hmm. That's something else than tolerance or saying. Oh, yeah, if you form it a little bit like this and like that, then you you are part just fit in this circle. Oh, make yeah. space for differences. My my space is also your space, and I think everyone should understand much more that it's not about these groups and labels, just making space for differences. Yeah. And I'm proud yeah. of that. I love striving for that. Yeah, yeah amazing. Yeah, and, and your storytelling really seems to be a tool to also break some taboos around certain topics and you know you as you explain your personal anecdotes and I can definitely imagine that they you know they set the stage for other people to you know either see themselves reflected in your stories or to continue sharing their own and yeah it becomes a beautiful snowball effect of storytelling so yeah it's actually a good thing what you said because I don't ask people on my tour anything personal mm. see the funny fun thing or the funny or the incredible the cool thing about sharing a personal story if you start doing it is the effect even if you don't want it that at one point the other person also wants to share a personal story because it feels pleasant mm -hmm. so I like that way also that I don't ask people to tell something that happens so yeah. it's a very organic way yeah, I was thinking about that the other day about storytelling and how actually it's a it's a reciprocal um, act, right? Because you have you, the storyteller, on your tours then, but you also have the listeners and, you know, you're actively listening. And and I, I think it creates a space for spontaneous um, sharing of, yeah, each other's stories. Um that's that's really great. And and you you mentioned your activism. So do you feel like your activism pours over into your into your storytelling, or how how else do you view yourself as an activist, and how do you engage with that? Yeah, I think it's, I see it in everything. So sometimes I try to make it a bit less. Like I see that people are not used to it here. But also, maybe people have a lot of fire and passion. It's not per se like. North or Middle Europe fitting, <laughs> uh, so I see I see that uh, in 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 common that I I point out things because I see them and um, so so it's in everything. Um, people can perceive that as a negative or something, and that makes it sometimes a bit 
difficult for me to find it okay for myself to look like that. Or, mm -hmm. um, the, the activism is in, is in everything. Like here in my living room, I have uh, white silence is violence. And it's from a Black Lives Matter um, sign uh, of last year. Mm -hmm. And I put it on purpose actually in my living room because for all the Zoom calls and everything, uh, it's like it's there and uh, sometimes at the back. Um, and I like that a lot. That gives me really good, good feeling. Um, uh, sometimes, yeah, see things and, and they have to do something with it for themselves. It's, mm -hmm. it's the same as, as with these, um, these stories, sorry, the personal stories I tell, I'm not, they don't have to react. They don't have to do something with it. How they heard it so it has an effect on you yeah if you if you know it it has an effect so i i love to point out things also in my tour then it's like now you have the information this is my opinion now you have to make your own opinion on it mm -hmm. uh, and i think that's like uh, that's how my activism is in everything yeah pointing out things pointing out things giving information that people normally don't get or mm -hmm. like different perspectives. Yeah, yeah. So your activism is kind of, it's not, it's not like a, a choice you make. It's just kind of there. Like, yeah. it, it's just a part of the way you do life, I guess. Um, yeah. Nice. Um, so in your tours, uh, you said you like to make a point of things. Are there, is there any aspects on your tour that, bring that out or or do you integrate into your tour like yeah specific things i think at every point so so the first story i start so my, my cat is now doing kind of jumping jacks for attention <laughs> uh, back and forth to the living room actually and there's one again yeah you can hear it uh, Cute. We, we both want the spotlight i guess yeah the cat's like wait what about me I always start at a national monument. It's a monument for to remember the victims of the Second World War on, on the Times Square in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And an uh, important monument, absolutely. No but. Uh, and there are uh, also other stories uh, connected to it. For mm -hmm. example, when they started uh, to commemorate at that monument, it was only for the Jewish victims and the gay victims were... Um, commemorated and two gay men actually uh, protested uh, I think it was in the 50s or 60s they got arrested um, they, and they had on their clothing a pink triangle uh, mm -hmm. like uh, here or gay people in the camps had in the second world war so they got arrested here during a commemoration from that point actually started the action of wanting a homo monument mm -hmm. and I always tell that story because I think that's the important story that I want to tell because it's not very known. Yeah. Um, so I think there's the activism and all the time pointing out that things change, symbols change because people take action on it. Uh, there are well, maybe a big surprise for a lot of people. There are unicorns in the, um, in the royal palace at the outside actually. Uh -huh. And at one point, unicorns were the most masculine symbol you can think of, maybe because of, I don't know, the horn on the head. Mm -hmm. But now it's a symbol for the queer community or the symbol of being yourself. <coughs> it's, it's because people took action. It's because people said, hey, we are now taking this symbol and making meaning to it. Yeah. So also show that we, again, make this history and you can take action and do something make a difference yeah um sorry it's ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> so your your walking tours are like a just like a a walking archive of the history that you bring to life on your on your tours yeah i hope so um, although when people ask uh, year numbers although i do it now for three years the tour it just fall off my head i'm really <laughs> attached to the story so it's really hard uh, yeah. well at least numbers can be written down and then your stories can be told yeah um that's amazing that's great um 
I'm seeing that we're slowly running out of um, or nearing the end, not running out mm-hmm. of time. We have ample time. But so I wanted to still touch upon. Um, so everything is opening up now. And what are your what does the future look like for you and LGB tours? To be very honest, I'm thinking a lot about how I can put a price on a tour that's for everyone. Mm. So now I put the, uh, the price on the tour a bit higher to earn money and um, because there are less, less people, but immediately that works not the way I want because back in society, uh, uh, um, this time white gay men only in couples uh, book private tours with me. And that's not uh, the only thing I want. Mm-hmm. I want it especially for everyone and especially for uh, people yeah, who need it much to, or who feel very attached to the queer community. Mm-hmm. Also, I find it important. Uh, and as in society, the in the queer community, there are is the same hierarchy actually. Uh, and I want to work very hard to to make it more um, equal. Or what's the word for gelijkwaardig? Um, inclusive, Equ- equitable. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'm, I don't know, uh, I'm actually thinking a lot about that because we live in a capitalistic society that mm-hmm. is very, really important uh, how I do that and that I can still uh, rent my house and have everyone on my tour who want to. I also know, again, that not a lot of people talk about this, how you can yes. do that with money, but I would love to hear how I can do that. I'm not thinking about like having one amount for every tour and if you book in you say yeah i'm open to if there are 10, 10 people on the tour then maybe at the end when it's 10 people then you only pay 15 and if you are with two people then you pay 50 each and you mm-hmm. want a private tour something like that yeah um, so i really really want to work on this community thing and and want it for everyone also never you cannot um, pay for the tour um, you're always welcome that's it that's very important to me that was always and will always be okay. uh, yeah but I'm still not sure yet how I can fit my ideology of LGBT tour in this world. in this world yeah 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 that makes a lot of sense well it sounds like you're doing a lot of brainstorming to make sure that your tours which are so lovely are accessible to everybody yeah and, um, and they are so if people watching they are definitely are <laughs> they are just brilliant and you can find a way yeah, yeah. amazing and I, i'm curious so are your tours also open so if three people book at the same time but there's completely independent parties do you do the tour together or how does that work is it also a way for people to to meet more queer people on their yeah. on their walk it's a good question. Sorry, that I all the time say, of course, it's a good question. <laughs> it's just like me uh, using the time to think about the answer. Very wise. <laughs> um, I started, uh, so I will talk about my tour, how it always has been. So it will now. So I started to put my tour on Airbnb experiences a few years ago. I started mm-hmm. and I did it on purpose because I want to have the biggest audience, the biggest platform, the widest range of people who can be interested maybe in queer tour and book something from around the world and book something um, instead of only like queers who were, who would totally, who I would totally identify with. So because to share stories and learn from each other all the time. Mm-hmm. So that's always what I did. And Airbnb experience works in that way uh, It's for you can book for 10 people, for private tours. I didn't do on the platform. That was maybe via my Dutch uh, network. So you book in, then you are with people from all around the world. So definitely I had people from South Korea, uh, a young couple, to get a queer couple together with a, with a guy in his 70s from Greenland, together with someone from Iceland, together with straight allies from Germany. And, and it was, yeah so interesting also to juggle a bit like where are they in their also in their language in Mm -hmm. um their discourse even talking about it what's new to them how do you connect them in a way that there is space for differences in two hours 
Um, I like the challenge a lot, uh, but also I can do one tour a day because I'm like, um, I'm like totally, my energy is um, very, I'm very happy, but uh, there's no organized space in my brain anymore <laughs> after that. Um, yeah. So it was always like that. Uh, now it will be, I think it's, so if COVID hit hard around the world also financially, uh, going to be different tourists here also. Mm -hmm. Of course, it is already, tourism is already like a selection of people who are able to travel and have money for that. Yes, definitely. So, yeah, I'm curious. I don't know. The first two, two people who booked were uh, two, two uh, older uh, gay men. And, and it's not always, to be honest, that they like my tour. It's the only uh, stereotype. It's the only group that uh, sometimes uh, they don't connect with my stories mm. and I do understand it from a, from a also privileged point of view maybe some 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 things I share don't resonate or, yeah what do you think the the reason is if I may ask uh, because of uh, um, could be different things to be honest sometimes I see that um, they want to be as normal as possible and I think if you have um, some privilege because you're a guy and you're a certain age and you're white and you have a good earning a job then you have privilege uh, the non-privileged part is maybe the gay sometimes they don't like the confrontation mm. i talk about so they want a life as normal as possible and maybe they can they can for a big part um, live like that but that's like filling in for my point because i yeah. really experienced like a few times that it really didn't match only with um, these these group the couples mm -hmm. I think it's from that point and also that they don't understand some things that I talk about uh, like uh, more um, space like more equity in the queer community itself mm -hmm. uh, like you see in society right um, it's uh, yeah like lack, lack of understanding and and don't having the experience in a way Mm -hmm. uh, being a minority it's interesting yeah. because with the gay thing yeah yeah it's uh you know we have our queer communities but within those we still rely on like micro micro ecosystems of the yeah the society that we still belong to so we generate the same systems of oppression within those groups um, it's concentrated yeah. exactly so you know we're queer but doesn't exempt us from our own ability to oppress others and sometimes that's yeah people need to be confronted with them with that and if you're on an lgb tour maybe it's not always what someone is looking for but definitely yeah. very very important um yeah. so i do that by uh, you having the rainbow flag and the new pride flag with me mm. yeah then i just ask which one do you prefer more um mm. only when they ask my opinion i will i will give it yeah. my opinion and it can sometimes be be totally different then it's straight people or um, white gay men. If I put it in numbers of the people in my tour, uh, so it can be stereotypically, but it's typical. But so I had a lot of people on my tour. Yeah. Uh, maybe I a little bit in numbers too. Mm -hmm. That's a great uh, leading question about the flags. Um, I wanted to ask one more question so that uh, our listeners also know um, how long how long is one of your tours? uh one and a half to two hours okay nice so now it's still not busy in the it's, in english it's it's called the red light district actually mm -hmm. it doesn't fit with it's just an old historical heart and also in dutch it's called actually to the holes for the water um it's in the red light district and that's not busy at all at the moment so mm -hmm. maybe it's one and a half hours okay yeah <laughs> less it depends uh, on the talks we have to get out also yeah nice yeah it depends on the human traffic that you need to navigate through uh which i can imagine currently is uh not super high um let's see we are going into our q a uh, moment um but before we do that do you have anything else that you are itching to share or itching for our listeners to know about Oh, 
Oh, <laughs> my head is already full of my own <laughs> answers and questions I asked asked myself, like what to do with this and that. No, it was it really enjoyed uh, thinking also with you and talking with you. Wonderful. Well, then I will leave it up to the audience who's hopefully itching to ask you questions then. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. All righty, we have a question, which is... Yeah, there are many. Sorry, let's read it. Yeah, you can read it. <laughs> um, the question is, can you share an unforgettable story um, that you had with one of your guests? Yes, yes, I can. So I think... I always put it across my head. So <clears throat> one story is... Um, I was with the um, father and uh, they're just out of the closet non-binary kid uh, and they were from the States and we were doing a tour. They were doing the most queer holiday possible. Mm -hmm. The kid just um, uh, got their diploma from college. Mm -hmm. and we were standing on one of the bridges where I was talking about uh, Right or um, uh, cannot parade in Amsterdam and when it started and I had this tote bag with rainbow flags uh, with me and suddenly uh, in between my story this guy approached me and he looked quite nervous and he tapped my shoulder and said like um, um, can I ask you something uh, yeah of course and then he asked uh, do you know where I can find a secret garden uh, and I was quiet for some seconds because I thought uh, and I knew the place. I knew that almost no one in that area would know it. It's a place for queer refugees around the world uh, where they can find shelter and also um, uh, it is support, advice mm -hmm. on, on law and how to stay here. Or, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the word for it. Actually. Um, uh, so I looked at at the the, uh, the two people who were on my tour, the dad and, and the kid. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, and I looked up the address of it, and it was quite close uh, in the red light district. So we became suddenly like a tour in a tour or something. And the guy, his name was Khalid, and he told us that he was just like just arrived uh, in the Netherlands from Syria, mm -hmm. Syria uh, as a refugee. Um, and, he, and he was staying at an um, asylum at the south of the Netherlands. And he was suddenly like, his words were like a um, fountain from, from his mouth. And you saw like how happy he was to suddenly share stories with queers and talking open. He said, oh, we're not allowed to put our rainbow flag in the room, but we are with the, with the gays together and we still do it. And he, he talked all the way through and we stopped at the point where I thought the secret garden was. Mm -hmm. And actually it was not. So I called them, but they had a secret address. So again, we, we, we came like through the red light district as seals walking, like sharing stories with each other, exactly how I, yeah, where my heart is, where my heart is. And uh, at the end, we found the place and we all like hugged each other and had tears in our eyes and wished Khalid the best. And uh, we did with the people of Secret Garden. And I continued to tour with, uh, with the dad and the kid. And we were actually all three quite silent at the beginning. And at one point I thought, okay, I'm the tour guide. I have to say something now. But it was a very, very, very special um, meeting. Mm -hmm. And I still have contact with them. At the other side, um, I have a lot of these connections with people. Uh, and uh, I would say that 50% of the people on my tour I'm still in contact with. Wow. Uh, on Instagram and they feel like really like close to me mm -hmm. uh, one pe a person who was because they were all once on my tour and they're from all around the world 
person just bought me a ticket for uh, RuPaul's Drag Race in January over here wow. just for me to go to. And other person put a tattoo on the arm about my door. Uh, it's not, it's just like making a space to share these stories. Um, it's even as important for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And then maybe it was my idea, but it's, it's like um, very, very special. One short fun story. I yeah. once had a um, priest on my tour, but it was from the Protestant church here, so it's a bit more liberal. Mm -hmm. I was still like nervous, like, can I give that glittery alcohol shot at the beginning? Can I tell that story about the stolen phone and that I man manipulated the thief? Like, I was super nervous. Then I told all these things, and actually during my tour, uh, in the <laughs> beginning, I always stop in front of the... Um, a shop just to look at the shop not go in of a king fetish store a gay king fetish store and suddenly i felt like i think he wants he wants to go in it was not a conscious thought but right. i heard myself say hey let's go <laughs> then we went into the shop and we were there he was there for half an hour and the day after he sent me an email thank you so much summer for taking me to that king and letter store because by myself i would never go there but i really wanted to uh, so I have a wow amazing, amazing it sounds like you are just filled with all these stories that are just so lively and so unique in each uh in their own way um that's incredible uh we have time for one more question and we do have one uh which is what advice would you give to someone who wants to start a queer tour in their own country yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, I talked about this a few times with people. This one guy has this website, Queer Europe. He once started real queer places he visited while traveling. Mm -hmm. So it's still like a dream or an idea to, to help people being a queer host around the world. I would totally support that. I think the, uh, the advice would be uh, know what you want to share. Uh, uh, what you want to share and what you want with it and then and then find a platform where you can reach the people you want to reach that's all you need like never ask people for reviews or was never never had my attention on reviews but if you do something good then and all these things for example go by itself and they will find the place mm -hmm. um so I would say just do it. And also, I was scared to do it in public space a bit, like if it was safe or something. I know, well, it was here, but still. And never, never I had something uh, bad because I think with the group, uh, this energy, you already have to uh, show the or in public space and taking space, actually. Yeah. So I would just support it and go with it and, and say to yourself, I don't have to have an idea, just be myself. I don't have to all have it fit. My first tours, I just went for it. I just tried something and chat stories and walked my favorite pink route. Amazing. And now we're here. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have uh, another follow-up question to that, which is, uh, do you as aspire to expand to different cities? Yes, definitely. Yes, all these things, but then it's going to be more a company. So I'm thinking about that. But I would mm -hmm. love to train um, guides who are willing to do this from the idea of meeting people, like meeting people, like being curious mm -hmm. and being open, telling your stories every time, also just telling what comes up um, and leading them at the same point. So it's actually too two quotes you're wearing but yeah I would love to do that but also I would have to find it important then that people who are from this that city or feel that city in many ways or experienced partying in that city or being queer in that city mm -hmm. and tell the stories yeah 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 amazing so it sounds like LGBT tours is not is not done here it's not limited to Amsterdam but you have uh... oh, it's, it's uh, Yes, rebirthing. rebirthing. 
<laughs> continuous aspirations for LGBT yes. tours, as you should, because it sounds incredible. I don't, I'm, I can't see the listeners, but I hope they're just ex- as, as excited as I am to hop on one of your websites and book a tour soon. Yeah. Um, and we'll make sure to also make that information available to everybody. Um, yeah. So as I said, my new website agenda is still empty because it's like really new. It's uh, text is not good yet. I just want to say you can book tours from now on every moment. Please send a DM via Instagram LGB tours uh, when you want or your questions and, and we can book a tour. Amazing. Incredible. Cool. Be That's... Shy or be shy. I also feel I'm shy. And so. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> Um, so that's very clear. Awesome. So for anyone, I'm just going to repeat it. You can message Soma on uh, her Instagram, LGB Tours, um, for booking or questions. Um, amazing. LGBTour underscore Amsterdam. Perfect. Well, we've reached our time, um, but I still feel like we could have talked about so many more things, but we have to always leave everyone wanting a little bit more. <laughs> Um, so I'm excited to, you know, to have been able to have this opportunity to speak with you and to hear a little bit about how you started and where you are now and also what your future aspirations are. So I want to just thank you again for this amazing, amazing talk. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. Actually, I want to thank everyone because this helps me so much to, yeah, find new energy and support in, in continuing with the LGBT tour. And yeah. yeah, really, thank you. We, for one, are excited that, uh, you know, the restrictions now allow you to go back to doing what you love to do. So um, we wish you also the best of luck with that. And we hope that, uh, yeah, that it goes really well. And thank you, Ali, because it was really, really, really nice talk. Likewise, honestly, yeah. Very nice. Alrighty. Well then, um, I'm going to round it off and we will be, yeah, we will see each other on the pink tour. <laughs> Definitely. Alrighty. Bye, Sana. Bye.